Okay, the video is rolling. Has it started? The video is rolling, 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 rolling. Come on, here we go. Oh, it's live. It's gone live. Ooh, Fantastic. steady. Right, we can all go and get our little uh, our tweets ready. Um, so, uh, um, that's what gets them in live. Yeah, action. live tweeting so people can hear us tweet. Yeah. Right. Um, oh, I'm going to put a couple of emojis on this one. Um, the world can hear us, but I don't mind. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Canning going for the youth vote. <laughs> I'm not. No, no, no. I'm not Instagramming or TikToking it. I'm oh, just. Yeah. I'm just putting it on Twitter. I mean, there we go. It, uh, yeah, to see you uh, doing the TikTok dance is everything I think anyone uh, <laughs> wants to see, really. No, I don't. It's what we all live for. <laughs> and when it's done, it's all done. Yeah, okay. Should we um, just give us one second? I'm just going to put it in a Facebook group. There we go. East meets West. Okay. You ready, guys? Should we, ready, um, should we turn it on? Let's go. Let's go. Cool. Hello, and welcome to the East Meets West show, a live broadcast about all things Hellenic League. I'm Rob Davis, your host, and I'm joined by Ryan Butler of Seven Sports and uh, Tom Canning of Football in Berkshire. Hello. Hello, guys. Good evening. Evening. First of all, start off with a slight apology. Uh, we tried to do our first live broadcast in the middle of last week, and... Uh, it failed, perhaps due to the fact one of the uh, people on the couch was in uh, a foreign country. But no, it was nothing to do with that. It was absolutely nothing to do with that. I thought it would have been marvellous if we'd have had it from Croatia, but, you know, there we go. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, that didn't happen. But if anyone was uh, watching and wasn't able to see us then, <laughs> we'll make up for it today with double content. <laughs> That's what we I'm not doing an hour. Not do my, dinner's, my dinner's <laughs> just over there. I'm not doing an hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, gents, well... How have you been since we last spoke to you? Now, that's a loaded question. <laughs> that is, this is, yeah, that's a big question. That Well, personally for me, you know, it's, it's been well documented on, on Seven Sport and on Twitter. You know, I ended up in uh, Gloucester Royal on Saturday after passing out at a game. It was just so hot and I hadn't eaten, eaten anything at all. So, you know, I've had a, uh, a lecture from both my mum and a, a doctor. Um, so I've learnt my lesson the hard way, and, and I'm recuperating, and yeah, ready to go. I I enjoyed one of the comments, uh, sorry, one of the captions on one of your photos, which was, I told Kelsey to take some pictures. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, if, True if, pro. If, if people see a picture of me on the floor and think, why is Kelsey not helping? He's just taking a picture. <laughs> yeah, I was, laying there going, I was laying there going, Kelsey, you're taking pictures, are you documenting this? <laughs> <laughs> you got you got to be documenting it. we got to make sure that there's a, a paper trail and people can see that you know, this event has happened to the archives. Yeah, <laughs> fair, fair. So you're back fighting fit now, though. You're on top of Yeah, it. yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. It's still a bit warm, though. It's, it's yeah, 20, past, yeah. 20 past it's 8 at night, and I'm still sad thinking about how warm it is. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned there that you were actually at a game. I think you've been to a couple uh, since we uh, since we spoke last. Yeah, uh, technically. Technically been and seen two and a half games. Um, obviously on Saturday uh, it was the second half just kicking off when when I did uh, faint. So yeah, we've seen a you know three of the Hellenic Premier clubs uh, in Gloucestershire playing. So we've seen Long Levens win at, at Sirencester Town from the league above. Um, saw Fair get beat by Sirencester Town on, on the Tuesday, um, and then Brimscombe played Quedgley, who are a county league side um, round here. And and you know all three games were different and you know luckily for us plenty of goals and action to, to decipher as we uh, went there and I can report that while spectators weren't allowed um, the people that were in attendance and, and everything like that the social distancing being adhered to um, and really common sense was being used and applied in all three games and yeah it bodes well for the future really. That's what I was going to ask you really what uh, sort of 
obviously you were there in a, a, a reporting capacity, a journalistic capacity. So uh, you've got to go to the games. So uh, how is that for you? How is what's different about reporting in the age of COVID, and uh, what do we uh, uh, what can we expect when we go back to grounds? If we go back to grounds anytime soon, you get left alone quite a lot, <laughs> in the sense that you know usually there's there's always people around who you know recognise you, even ground hoppers who may not be. Um, affiliated to either club that are on show you know they like to have a, a chat catch up with what we've been doing let us know what they've been doing so it's been none of that interaction really on the uh, first Saturday at Siren it was probably more formal than than the other two games have been in the sense that I think that you know it was the first weekend Siren Sester were doing two games in in one eve in one day sorry so you know I think a lot of it was we need to stick to the rules here and because that's that's what in place is no one knew really anything anything different then go to the tuesday night at fairford town where it was a bit more you know the these are seven sport we know what they're about if we just put them here they can commentate and they can do their bits and and and, and what have you and you know fairford were really good at being organized and thinking about where everyone was going who was there because uh, your Sports Windham were there filming the game. Um, Spikes Diner, they opened that up. So, you know, people were, were passing, you know, with their food and, and things like that, not necessarily hanging around for the game or, or watching the game. You know, obviously that's a, a, a separate sort of takeaway outlet. So uh, there were a few people in passing, but they were quite methodical in where they sat everybody, which was great. And then on Saturday, just gone, you know, we spoke about it on our podcast. It's a public playing field. So, it was always going to be hard to police that. Realistically, the only people that, that were there were, you know, Brimscombe and Frupp committee members, um, myself and Kelsey, um, and then a few of the, the Quedgley third side um, hung around after after their friendly that was on the adjacent pitch had finished. So, again, you know, people have used their common sense, and I think that that is something that, that you know, we our advocates of on, at Seven Sport, and, and we talk about it on the podcast regularly, that, you know, it is up to everybody as individuals. You know, there is the, the common sense, the common conception that, you know, football fans are idiots, football fans are just going to do whatever they want. But at a grassroots level, you tend to find that people have their heads screwed on a bit more. Um, and, you know, rules and, and regulations and guidelines, they get adhered to. And, you know, everyone uses their common sense. And, yeah, I think... You know, the whole hashtag let fans in, which is, you know, I know we're going to discuss that. You know, it can be done. And, and I think it's about time that the government and the FA supported that and, and you know, give the clubs a bit more freedom to, to police it and control it. So, yeah, I, I was going to come on to that later, but as you touched on it now, um, there is a hashtag going around at the moment, hashtag let fans in, based around uh, the idea that grassroots or grassroots clubs steps low um, at steps lower down the league uh, should be able to let fans in to watch the games because the attendances tend to be quite manageable and so uh, social distancing and other precautions can be taken <coughs> um, what have you thought about these this hashtag and the uh, campaigns going along with it to get people in to stadiums I think I got so I don't know. I, I was asking a couple of chairmen today. I was speak, trying to speak to a couple of chairmen today, see what they thought um, to, about it, because I, I don't know whether I should have or whether whether FIB should have a stance on it. Um, yeah. I think I th I th ultimately, I think what 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 I'll say is that um, as long as it's safe, then fans should be allowed, and there's not really any reason. I think I, if I've got concerns, um, it's just you know steps clubs at steps four, five, six, seven. They're volunteers. And I would hate for them to be overwhelmed by, um, you know, a, a more more people than they expected, or you know, having to feel that they had to police this because because otherwise it goes back to them. I, th I think it's a there's an insurance issue in there as well if something goes wrong. Um, but and, you know, having to have these volunteers who actually would probably quite like to watch the game a bit as well, um, having to kind of police this this idea that that people have got. Have got to stay apart, which you know we're all used to, and we all should be able to do. But uh, you know, it, it all happens. But the, the other things, and it's just something I was just thinking about. Like 
you know, so the last time on 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 this show we were talking about uh, the the sort of the lockdown and the way that the leagues were finished, and I and there was an awful lot of people kind of saying that well, the the non-league game should be treated as the pro game, and they say all levels of football should be treated the same. I see you pulling a face, Ryan, you, you, but I saw a lot of people saying that, and suddenly now we're telling them that actually no, it's different. And it's like, what, what, how we have every. If we're complaining about messages coming out, we, as a group of non-league fans, have to be clear about what our message is. And to me, non-league football is very different to the professional game. I didn't buy into that idea that the pro game is the same as the non-league game. That's absolute nonsense. But um, you know, we we have to be clear about what our messages because that's what it's all about these days is about messages and and optics and what you put out there and but you know I ultimately I wouldn't want I wouldn't want um volunteers to be overwhelmed I think pre-season most pre-seasons at step four five six are played at park pitches they're rarely certainly around here they're rarely played at clubs home grounds unless it's uh uh, unless it's a sort of a, a, a big friendly against you know against a against a, a much bigger club, you know it'd be a bit like sort of Maidenhead going going to a Step Five club something like that, but you know sort of a prestige friendly something like that. I guess ultimately though, if you I, I was trying to think at Windsor it's not quite the same, um, at Reading City it's not quite the same, but if you go to Binfield you can go into the bar you can have a beer, and if there's a match on you can see it out the window. So. You know, we're, and it'll be like that a lot. Although I've mentioned two clubs where I don't think it is quite like that. Um, you know, there's a lot. Of, there will be a lot of clubs where it's like that, and you just the non-league game is different, especially at four, five, and six. Four, five, six, seven. You know, even even in that little group, step seven is very different to step four. So, you know, come on. <laughs> I, I agree with you, think Tom. I think you know, coming back to what I was saying earlier, you know. A lot of the people who who I've seen at games, you know, they are people who have their head screwed on compared to, for example, the the elite elite level football. And I think that if you really scale it down, the fans that you see at grassroots football, it's more of a community feel. You yeah. know, people are there because they want to be there for the whole experience to see their friends play a game of football. Um, and you know, it's that family feel around it. So. It's more of a, a purist level of football. For me, that's the difference I see for, yeah. for non-league football to say if it's a Premier League team. You know, a lot... I mean, my older brother's going to absolutely kill me that I'm just sort of uh, using him as an example here. But him and his friends, you know, they see Saturdays going to the football as, you know, a, a jolly up. It's a social occasion. It's, you know, it, there's more than just a game of football. Whereas, yeah. for example, tomorrow night, myself and Kelsey, we're going down to Slimbridge versus Yeet. You know... We're delighted to be going to that game, watching the game as a whole. You know, some of the Yate players used to play for Cinderford last year, so they've moved across there. So it, it's nice to just sort of see everybody in there. That's the social aspect of it for us, not the, you know, the big crowds, you know, chanting, the singing mm. and stuff like that. So that's why it's easier to police the let the fans yeah. in, let fans in movement at grassroots level, because you're not going to get inundated with numbers really. Um, coming back to obviously what you're saying about volunteers, you know, a lot of it will be down to the individual clubs because each club is different. You know, you know that, I know that, Rob knows that. You, know, you, you could probably think about it right now. A lot of the clubs in Berkshire are different to each other. And same for us up here with Gloucestershire. You know, all of our clubs are different. All the facilities they have are different to, to the next. So each individual club will just need to work out and finally tune what they can do as a club to yeah. limit the spectators you know, a lot of them have turn styles now, for example, or one entrance in. So setting up things like a one-way system so they can have someone on the door counting how many people are coming in. You know, if, you, if, they, if they're going to have a maximum of 100 people, it's someone doing the counting. That's all you need to do. So you know that when you're full up, you just have to say to people, unfortunately, we can't let anybody in. And, you know, it will frustrate people if that was to happen. But at the same time, it shows how proactive a club can be um, in, in self-policing that issue to get the fans through the gate and ultimately get money coming into the club and getting the players the support that they need. I think the earlier that these regulations do change, we're hoping that um, fans are coming back, the earlier the regulations change or the earlier there's guidance about it, we, the earlier the clubs can start acting. Of course. So, I mean, it's not, it might be the case that say, for example, I don't think this is going to happen, but uh, the coming weekend they say, okay, 
uh, clubs at steps five and below. You can let fans in, but maybe those clubs aren't ready yet because they haven't had the guidance. They haven't been able to set things up. So, I mean, it all starts coming from the guidance and um, and clubs need to know where they stand fairly soon because I think a lot of them need the income, obviously. Some don't. Some are in a lucky position. Yeah. But, um, others do. And so there's going to be a lot of clubs that are in a, a, quite a tough state if they can't let fans in soon. Um, perhaps that's not a reason to do it specifically, you know, especially in these current times. But it, it is sort of something that really needs to... Clubs need help out somehow. But, but the flip side of that, though, Rob, is, you know, a lot of people will see that things like pubs and places like that are open yes, to course. avoid them closing down. So it's almost a fine line of you know, how do you appease everybody? Because not everybody ate drinks alcohol, not everybody likes going to the pub, yep. but they like going to watch local football. That's yeah. their night out. That's their social interaction. That's them helping a local business. So yeah, no, you know, I, there's a I, fine line on how you differentiate the two, which, you know, it, it's always going to be hard. And we've said on, on even episode one, you're not going to be able to find a solution that's going to please everybody. And that's showing uh, not just in football, but in general. You know, it is hard to, to make sure everyone's happy, but of course, everybody's safe in equal measure. Yeah, I do agree. I think it's one of the sectors, lower league football anyway, that hasn't been looked at enough. And I think going back to what Tom's saying, it is, should be treated differently for professional football. Obviously, it should. Um, so I think more, um, perhaps the FA or the government between them need to get um, um, work something out a bit more clearly because it's there isn't much in the way of a plan, it seems like. So it just seems like a blanket stop on it. And so hopefully something can change soon. And like you say, it's a sector that needs the port. So why not? Uh, but you have been to a couple of games, like we said, looping back to where we were before. And I believe on your second game, there was actually uh, someone fairly high profile making his debut for a new club. <laughs> I think, of course, of uh, Ian Herring, former Hungerford Town manager who made his debut, or um, non-competitive uh, debut anyway, for Fairford Town in their pre-season friendly we went to some of that. On uh, Tuesday. Yes, last Tuesday. Okay. Um, yeah, first of all, how, how did he get on? How did um, the, the Fairford and Ian Herring specifically get on? Well, firstly, it was nice that I didn't really know anything about Ian as a, a player going into the game. I think that that helped me just take a step back and just watch him in action and, and see how he went about it. And honestly, you know, speaking to Jordan Bevan, the Fairford manager after the game, you know, he was full of high praise for Ian's performance and I would agree with it. You know, he, you know, based on that, I would give him the nickname of the mop because he was just mopping everything up in front of the back four, getting the ball down, playing it off, you know, getting Fairford further up the pitch. And I think that's obviously the job that he's been brought in to do at Fairford and, you know, Fairford as a team, they just lacked a little bit of a bite in the final third. Um, you know, even the management admitted that on the night. They only had one shot in the game um, that I can really remember. So that'll come with time, of course. And, and obviously when they get players in that can provide that. But, you know, he, he played, I think he was only played the first half. But it was a good showing and, and good to build on. He's, I think I imagine he played um, on Saturday in their, their second friendly. Um, but yeah, on Tuesday night, I'd have been very pleased if I was, I was him on his performance. And ultimately, um, Jody Bevan was, was delighted with what he saw. And he is still remaining, remains excited for, for Ian and, and obviously the season that they're hoping to have down at Fairford. Did you think it was a bit of an odd uh, signing, Ian Herring, going back to playing after having what you could probably argue is a pretty successful time at Hungerford? I mean, OK, the league positions weren't fantastic but i mean you've got to put that in context of the budget he was given uh for national league south and you know he kept hungerford up he, he didn't get relegated with hungerford do you think it was a surprise he went back to playing rather than maybe looking for another uh, job in management at a similar level tom <laughs> <laughs> um no i think that he from so so i don't know i, I know ian yeah, only probably over the last year where we'd been conversing about time at Hungerford when we expanded our website to cover Berkshire a bit more. But um, obviously he left Hungerford. Um, I think 
I don't, I don't know. I I sort of I got the feeling just just from sort of what he put on Twitter. I, I felt like he was missing it, um, and then I saw that he was making a sincere effort to get fit, uh, and so sort of putting two and two together, kind of thought maybe he'd end. And and then there was um, then he sort of alluded to it as well in a in a conversation with me. I think that was on Twitter as well. But um so so there was there was no great surprise that he that he signed for for a for a club. Um having having spent most of his career at the higher levels of of non league football and uh and, and a little bit in the professional game, uh it's not a not a great surprise. So uh but signing for signing for Fairford, um Fairford obviously they they were third last season, had a had it well. Uh, they sort of finished in that third spot at the at the end of that. Um, all I really know about Fair because I, I don't think I caught them last season. All I really know is that Rob and I spent one of the coldest nights we've ever had at one of the probably one of the worst games we've ever had the fortune to travel well over an hour to. They weren't involved though, to be fair. No, they weren't. They weren't, <laughs> and they, and the and the diner's great and all that. But um, no, I I don't know. I've I've always had a bit of a soft spot for Fairford. I went there. I remember driving there from having working in Canary Wharf and driving all the way over to Fairford for a Bracknell Town evening game. Uh, which finished on penalties, and obviously they didn't get home until ridiculously oh. late. So I've, you know, I, I've got, I've got a fair, I've got, a, I've got a soft spot in my in my heart for for Fairford Town, really. Um, I, but you know, Ian will do a great job wherever he goes because he's committed. Uh, what I know of Ian, he's committed. Um, he's, you know, he's an experienced player. He will only add value to that Fairford Town team without a doubt. Whether it's enough to get them into second or first, I don't know. But yeah, I was going to come to you on Ryan, uh, you Ryan, on that one. Do you think they're uh, good for a, a promotion push this next season, or is Binfield based, and Westfield still the ones to beat? I think based on what they've got, and uh, and you know they will kill me for for saying it really, but based on what they've got, I don't think so right now. But with the contacts that the likes of Jody Bevan, Jamie Reed, and Lee Randall have. If they can get the players in just to, to top that squad up, then I don't see why not. Unfortunately, Fairford, almost a victim of their own success in a way. Um, they lost Ben Lodge, who was a good winger, who scored some important goals for them at the start of last season. He went to Highworth. Um, it was about sort of October, November last year. And in my opinion, they haven't really replaced him. Um, they lost Connor Thompson, who was you know scoring all sorts of goals, dominating all sorts of games for them. In particularly in the league in that early sort of first six, well first half of the season, um, he's emigrated to, to the US now. You know Ross Langworthy does a job, but he needs a, a bit of support with him. I don't. I felt watching them on on that Tuesday, they just didn't get up up to him. They were playing the ball up to him, and he was winning headers. He was competing, but he just didn't have the support in and around him. And if they can get those players that can just have that forward line there then, yeah, I think they, they can because a lot of that squad is still the same squad as last year. Just needs finally tweaking. And, of course, you know, you've got to remember they've only had two pre-season games. Still no yeah. concrete start date. So, you know, by the time the season is about to start, I could easily sit here and say, yeah, they're going to be fighting for the title, let alone the promotion push or whatever. Mm-hmm. But based currently on that squad right now, they're probably, I would say, about four players short. And that's being harsh. I think particularly in any striker um, and probably another centre half based on what I've seen, if they can get that, then, then the, the squad's as good as it was. Good stuff. Well, you heard it here first. Uh, if they have those players, then uh, Butler's tipping them for the title. So uh, <laughs> we'll come back to you at the end if of that, the season. If that doesn't get me a free spike to Diner Burger, I don't know what will. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. That's what we're ultimately in it for. So. As much as right, I love a burger, um, I'm not driving all the way to Fairfield again <laughs> for a free burger. We'll have to, uh, yeah, we'll have to big up some more local sides and get some I, more. Uh, local true, food. true. I will take their sponsorship, however. <laughs> Very good. Right. Um, next section: news. Uh, do we have any news uh, coming from the? Let's start with the east side of um, the Hellenic this time. Do we, do we have to? Because I forgot to load it up. And... <laughs> or we can start with the West. Yeah, um, exciting news uh, coming out of the West in the last 24 hours, really. Uh, Bishop's Cleave, they will be revamping Kate Lane. 
um, to install a, a 3G pitch that should be ready for the start of the 2021-22 season. You know, if you look back at the, the suspended season, Bishop's Cleef had a frustrating time of it, really, because they didn't play a lot of football. Um, from about October onwards, their pitch just got absolutely sodden. Um, you know, they had their under-18s and the reserve side playing on it too. Um, and the pitch just couldn't dry. It just wasn't allowed enough time to dry. I think they played one game um, in about three months at home. And that was against Brimstone and Frupp. And everyone I spoke to who played on it or coached on it turned around and said, right, you know, that game should not have been played. So, you know, it took a bit of a battering. Um, so it's, it's a smart decision. Um, I think, you know, the timing is right to, to start looking towards that with a new manager in place um, to try and look for a new era for Bishop's Cleave as they try to get themselves back into the Southern League. Um, they've lost a couple of players to, to Cinderford with Stephen Quill going. Um, and taking the managerial position there, which was expected, really. Um, but they've kept Freddie Ward, you know, experienced, experienced central midfielder in a similar sort of mould as, as Ian Herring, really. He'll be Bishop Steve's version uh, in the way he plays. And he, he is literally Benjamin Button. You know, he's one of the fittest men you'll ever see. Um, but yeah, he's a veteran of the game. And, and, you know, it's credit to him for keeping himself in such good condition and having such a high performance level, even at a decent level like that. Good. Uh, do you know when the um, new work's going to start, and uh, where are they going to be playing elsewhere while it's going on, or is it? No, make... I, I think, not, it's, it's sort of early days, really. I, I haven't seen too much information about it other than a, a few tweets. So it'll be interesting to see once the details are released exactly what the time scale is, what they're they're planning to do um, in the interim. But yeah, it's all positive for Bishop Steve. I think in the long term, um, it's a fast, fantastic opportunity for them. Cool. Is it still cool. is it still crazy windy there? Uh, yes. I remember yeah. the the one time I've been there, it was uh, absolutely blowing a gale, and I wondered if it was just the once. But crikey, it's a little bit open, Bishop's Cleave, especially down the far end. Yeah. So yeah. You are, you know, exposed to those elements um, in a big way. Part of the fun, I think. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, what we got from the east? From, from my side of things, you've got um, Reading City have signed a young lad called Lewis Bebb. Um, he played for Bracknell Town's reserve side last season. Bracknell Town's reserve side finished second in the Suburban League. Um, he also played for Camberley Town in the Combined Counties League. Uh, I've not seen him play. Um, he's, he's new on my radar, so I'll be interested to see how he does. Um, also, Reading, like a number of other clubs, have received £500 towards making the ground safe um that seems like uh, quite a quite a good initiative that's from the fa and the premier league's preparation fund and um, that's done very well but also in um ex-professional player news dave tuttle uh, has been uh, confirmed as afc aldermaston's manager for uh, next season uh continuing on from uh, i think halfway through last season when he took over um they dave has uh, the unfortunate um in in my mind he <sighs> It's probably it's really harsh to say because he came into he came into Bracknell all those years ago um, on a budget of nothing and was expected to perform miracles and um, you know it didn't really work out. There were a lot of young, uh, young a young a lot of young Reading Reading FC players came in. One of them being Michael Hector, who's just been promoted to the Premier League. Um, but yeah, it didn't it didn't really work. But he's he's won Division One East with Henley Town as well. So you know he's he knows what that level of football is all about. Um, and I would expect AFC Aldermaston to have to, to do to do reasonably well next season. Um, I I love their ground. Uh, it's a it's a it's a strange place. It's in the Atomic Weapons Establishment uh, mm. on the outskirts of uh, of uh, well Aldermaston, obviously. Um, but yeah, it's it's sort of you go into this sort of um, heavily armed place, and there's a football ground in there, and there's a social club with a brilliant bar, and it's probably the the best match, the sort of pre-match food in. You know, you can have a full pub lunch if you like. Um, AFC Aldermaston certainly a place I'd I'd recommend going to visit. It's a, but it's a it's a sort of it's 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 strange in that it's niche enough to be really interesting. Very good. And, yeah. 
that's my news. I don't think I, no, I don't have anything else. That's it. You had uh, you had Ashley James taking over. At oh, Burnham. that was it. Yes, Ashley James uh, has taken over at Burnham. Burnham are just outside of our area. I forgot about that. Thank you. Um, he's just been appointed Burnham manager. Paul Shown stepped down. It's Shown or Sean? I don't know. Shown. I'm going with Shown. Um, <laughs> stepped down uh, a couple of weeks ago. Ash James, I think, was uh, on the playing staff, and I believe was also previously manager of Egham Town. Uh, and had played at Thatcham Town, and I think might have been part of the FA Vars winning side. So, you know, that'll be a good appointment for them, I suspect. Burnham's one of those clubs that were absolutely flying high for for a number of years. They they were in the, the, the Isthmian League, the Southern League, and they've just had an absolute fall from grace over the last couple of years. But they're back in the Hellenic Premier as of last season, and, you know, we do, we're doing all right. They, you know... It's a strange old ground, though, Burnham, because on one side you've almost got like a a, a League Two style grandstand, and the rest Next of it's just complex, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything, yeah. yeah. Um, I, th- I think it's it's a it's a strange old place to go, but you know, good luck to them. Good luck to uh, the Gore, my favourite named ground aside from the dripping pan at Lewis. <laughs> Very nice. Well. That's the end of the news. We move on to our next feature, the uh, team of the season for the 2019-20 uh, season <laughs> that never was. This will go well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so last week or last time we uh, voted on uh, or we put a Twitter poll out for our, our goalkeeper for the team of the season. Uh, the contenders were Charlie York of Reading City, Harry Harrison Ellis of Fairford, uh, Chris Grace of Binfield and Harvey Rivers of Westfields. And with 44% of the vote, Charlie York from Reading City was voted in as candidate of um, our first member of the team of the season. So well done to him, and we now have a goalkeeper. So this week, we're coming on to our fullbacks, right back and left backs. Um, do you want to kick us off on this? Who, Which contenders have you got for uh, the fullback positions? Well, I've managed to limit my shortlist then you know i had 10 goalkeepers um pretty much half the league uh, in episode one so i've limited to four right back four left nice even distribution amongst it um you know straight away the the pairing at bishop's cleave luke payne at right back adam mace at left back um a bit naughty really on the fact that uh, both of them have since left the club but <laughs> for, for the quality they possess you know they've both moved back up into the southern league and I think that's testament to, to just how good they actually are. They were seven league uh, quality players last year, seven league quality players this year. Um, so I have no doubt that they'll do well at a higher level. You know, as I said, Bishop Sleeves didn't play too many times compared to a number of the other clubs. But, you know, the quality was there from both of them. Luke Payne, for example, scored the winner at Brimscombe. Um, so he, you know, he asked to get a mention for just how much he improved that Brim, uh, Bishop Sleeves defence. And Adam Mace, you know, He's one of my favourite players uh, in the county. You know, a lot of people will probably tweet me um, after that. And but, but he is, for me, still the best left-back in Gloucestershire in non-league football. Um, that I've seen anyway. You know, he is just a different class, you know. He is quality on the ball. He can score goals. He can, you know, pick a pass out. He was captain at Bishop's Cleave as well. So he has that element about him. So they both make it at my shortlist. Um, Westfield's pairing as well I've got Sam Rawlins who used to play for Gloucester City um, a few years ago and Ollie Butler who used to play for Bishop's Cleave so we know them in the county again you know playing for Westfield you're always going to get um, looked at you know Ollie Butler I've got here played 26 times Sam Rawlins uh, 22 so consistently performing at a high level for Westfield um, I've got Callum Priest at Fairford for right back um, and I'll go out on a, a limb right now and say that he is my overall choice for the right back. He's my nomination to go forward on that. Um, you know, again, captain of Fairford last year. They were chalk and cheese um, compared to previous seasons that we've seen them. And he was just that little bit of quality at the back and part of a good back five. Um, Jamie Bremner from Brimscombe and Frupp makes my short list. You know, Brimscombe, who finished quite low in the table and started the season very slowly. He makes it for me, despite the fact he probably played in about 10 different positions for them last season. Um, when I saw him play predominantly as a left-back, um, and he was quality, and he really was. Uh, left-back, I've also put Nick Stanley, who played at Shrivenham. Again, played a number of positions for Shrivenham throughout the season, but he is predominantly a left-back. He's since joined Fairford for this campaign. Um, and after seeing him on Tuesday night, again, like Ian Heron, 
exciting to see how he can lift that squad and take them forward. And the, the final mention for me, um, for right back, is Sam Hill, um, who has been at Tuffley Rovers for years. He's now departed Tuffley because he's leaving the UK to go and teach in Dubai, which is a fantastic opportunity for anybody. So he is going to be a big miss, not just as a player, but as a person as well. And, and he had a, a bad season last year of injury. Um, you know, otherwise he, you know, will be my favourite right back uh, in the league. So, you know, he is a, a big miss and, and I wish him well. But they're my shortlist. And you know, as I said, my nominations really are Callum Priest and, and Adam Mace uh, accordingly. I thought you might have gone for uh, one that from the West that I had that you didn't was Isaac Johns at uh, Longleaf. He's yeah. uh, got uh, yeah, 28 games and six goals last year, uh, left back slash left wing back. I was going to say, the interesting thing about Isaac Johns is he's actually uh, originally a striker. Yeah. So what it is, because of how he plays uh, the game and how dedicated he is and how, you know, if, if Craig Martin tells him, you know, to jump, he'll ask how high and he's that dedicated as a young player. He has that discipline to play at, at left wing back and, and really... Some of the best performances that I've seen from him have been at left wing back, which is, mm. you know, for a young player to have that sort of discipline. Um, I'm delighted that, that you, you've put him on that list, to be fair. And, and yeah, I think he's a, an underrated player for sure. Cool. Uh, you want to add uh, one or two more from the uh, east side of things? Right. Oh. So my problem here is that. Um, <laughs> The 2019-20 season was a long time ago. Um, I, I, full, fullbacks are tough because if you're if you're a really good fullback, you're going to be getting up and down and getting forward. And 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 if you're a bad fullback, I, I don't know. I'm not really sure what I'm trying to say. That I'm just trying to be, it's, just fill some time for a second. But <laughs> basically, over this way, I think. There have been a lot of fullbacks. Um, I think uh, when we get to centre backs next week, I'll give you a list. No problem. I, I find it hard to identify fullbacks. I, th I think, um, like I think, Binfield had have had four really good fullbacks all season. Um, Reading City, Windsor, Virginia Water. You know, I, I basically I can't pick them out. And I'm sorry, I'm a, I was a fullback myself. And um, maybe that's my problem. I don't know. Anyway, um, I've got one and a half. Um, so I think uh, the fullback I will put forward is Jack Thompson Wheeler from Binfield. Played 31 games, two goals. Uh, never barely put a foot wrong all season, uh, in my opinion. Um, I, I thought he was excellent. You did. You had uh, Callum Gallimore on the opposite side. Will Shaw also played there, um, and and they, they've had, they had a couple of other players. Uh, you know, Callum Gallimore is a, a terrific player, um, but you know, Jack Thompson Wheeler played 31 games. He was consistent as far as I could see um, throughout the season. He's my nomination. There is another lad, but I think I saw him play the previous season. It's a guy called Tom Griffiths who plays for Ardley United, and. I'm pretty sure I saw him the previous season, and I think he played left back, right back, and centre back in the throughout the game that he was in. Um, but I'm pretty sure it was the previous season. I, he, he did. It looks like he did play for Ardley last season, but I, I don't think he qualifies because I don't think I saw him last season. I think it was the previous season. But I, I you know, I might put him forward in there. But basically, uh, Jack Thompson Wheeler gets my vote, um, not least because his mum once told me off because I called him Jack Wheeler Thompson. <laughs> is that right back? Is he right back or left back? I, can't I think it's, it's definitely right back. Yeah, right back. And Elliot Leg as well was another one. Yeah, yes, that's the yeah. Sorry, Elliot Leg is the fourth one. He's yeah. the fourth Binfield. For the, you know, just four excellent fullbacks, but Jack certainly played the majority of the games. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Elliot Leg for comparison, example, uh, for example, scored. Uh, he played in fourteen games. He did score three goals in that time. <laughs> left. Back. Um, yeah. Unbelievable player. Terrific player. Yeah. So he was going to be on my list as well. Um, it's also Arthur Furness of uh, Reading, who is playing. Uh, at oh, he's he's gone now, isn't he? He's left. Uh, he's left very recently, yeah. So in the, in the last week or so, I think. So yeah. So he was going to be another one. Uh, but I also uh, um, there was a sort of an honourable mention for um, club stalwart of Reading City, Austin Best, who was playing a lot of games at right back last season, um, despite uh, you know that not being his 
natural position, or it is a position that he sort of has adapted to as the season went on. So uh, he certainly he got um, a lot of praise from uh, his boss when he resigned uh, uh, this week, I think it was. So um, I was going to throw him in there for an honourable mention. Anyway, I think we've got to get this down to four in each position. I imagine we can uh, probably, rather than do the admin now, we can do that slight, uh, slightly off air and uh, we'll come up with a list. You've heard, heard our contenders and we'll narrow it down to four each. Let's we'll... narrow it down to four now. Let's do it. You reckon? Yeah. So I've, I've, I've been taking notes. Obviously, we've got uh, Callum Priest and Jack Thompson Wheeler for right back currently. Um, do you want to put Austin Best in there from Reading City, Rob? Uh, yeah, well, it was certainly an honourable honourable mention, yeah. And you had Elliot Legg from Binfield. You said he played on the, the left-hand side. Yeah, he's left. Yeah. My only caveat with Elliot is he, I don't think he played enough games. Yeah, he played 14 games. So it's not I hate bad. to be that. Like, next season, if he plays if he plays 30 Rory games, then. if he plays 30 games next season, I, it, I don't know. Are we doing right-backs, a one right-back vote and one left-back vote? Yeah, ideally. Okay. Okay, Elliot Leg is a right back, left back, right back. I think he's a left back. Yeah, I think he plays yeah. um, off oh, the. Oh it's wrong. not my night. Is all I will say. <laughs> um, well, okay, you know, I could have got it wrong, and then uh, he's probably played both sides for all I know, and then uh, yeah, I'll get pelters later on. But the, I don't know. I, the thing is, if you're going left backs, I don't think you can have Elliot Leg above Gallimore. Okay, let's go for that then. Just based based on games played, but there we go. So we we narrowed this down. Yep. So we got two left backs and three right backs. Cool. Okay. Are we do so we do is it two two right backs against each other and three left backs against each other? Is that what we're doing? Uh, so what I'm thinking is doing two polls on seven sport, one for yep. right backs, one for left backs. Just do yep. it. Yeah. Four right Fine. backs against each other. So yep. we need a we need a right back and we need two left backs. Okay. Well, do you want to put Isaac Johnson for the left back position? You were very keen that I brought him up. Long Levens yeah. will be absolutely delighted that Isaac Johnson. Now, he's, <laughs> he's named the yeah. uh, named manager's player of the year, to, which was a shock to everybody, um, including him. Um, but he's a wonderful <laughs> young man. Looks like Johnny Bravo and a hell of a player. So we'll take it. <laughs> okay. And then uh, um, I think, like I say, we've only got East players in at the moment, have we? So, uh, or have you put some of your uh, top? So we've got, out, out of the six now, we've got we've got three from the west, three from the east. Should okay. we leave it at that? <laughs> well, what I can do is we can add. Uh, I've got I've got players from from Westfield and also Brimskirm and, and Shrivenham in my list. So okay, maybe if I just drop one of each in there. Fine by me. I have nothing else to add to this conversation. <laughs> well, we'll add we'll add Luke Payne to the to the right backs. I'd if I, I'd just like to apologise to all full backs who might be watching this at any point, uh, I will be paying extra special attention to fullbacks next season. Yeah, we'll uh, get lots of comments about this one. And, uh, Hopefully. Yeah. And I've decided we'll go Nick Stanley for left-back. from <laughs> It's nothing if not a uh, democracy. Uh, West, Westwoods won't be happy. I've just picked against both of their, their, their choices I've got on there. But They're quite far I'll, from you, though, aren't they? I'll, I'll take the bullet on that one, I think. <laughs> yeah, you're a long way away. But... West is best, yeah. and it always is, so we'll do that. Mm. Very good. Okay, so those polls will be up online shortly after the, the uh, conclusion of the broadcast, and uh, we'll hopefully, hopefully get you voting, and we'll reveal the results next week, or whenever we uh, broadcast next. Next Monday, Whenever hopefully. And a reminder, if you disagree with us, let us know. <laughs> yes. If you think it was stupid for what we're saying, just tweet us. Just, you reply yeah. to the oh, point saying, yeah. come on, lads, how have you missed this player off? You have clearly yeah. got a thicker skin than I have, because I was saying, don't tweet us at all, just leave it alone. <laughs> you know, just just keep it in your head and just, you know, all let, let it go. Let it so, go. You know, just let even, it go. Even the negative tweets can be uh, spun into a positive way. Exactly, yeah. Engagement is key. There we go. So, um... What have you guys got on this week? Are we looking at any football, uh, looking forward to what's going on? Are we going to any games? Are we looking forward to any games that are coming up? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm at Slimbridge versus Yate tomorrow, as I said earlier on. Um, Slimbridge are one of our seven league sides in the area, so it'll be nice to get a full commentary um, with Kelsey under our belts. You know, we've managed to sort the server issues out that we had. They limited us previously, so yeah, delighted with that. Thursday, there's a Thursday night game. 
Um, first chance to see Tuffley Rovers in action. So we're heading down to Cleveland Park for that one. Um, and then there's a game on Saturday, which, you know, me and Kelsey have left our options open um, and we'll discuss over the week which game to go to. But it's nice to just have the option um, to, to get to a game. Absolutely, yeah. Tommy, you uh, got any? You got your eyes on, or you're looking forward to? Uh, it depends. It's a it's a difficult weekend for uh, family reasons. If there was a game that I was going to go to, um, it would probably be Reading City v Hartley Whitney, um, in a press sort of capacity. Capacity, yes. Uh, don't go to Reading City <laughs> v Hartley Whitney um, unless between now and uh, the end of the week they say let fans in. Or they let fans in. So, yeah, all of these uh, look forwards are done in a journalistic capacity, as Tom said. So, Absolutely. Yeah, and which, as it goes, we put, myself, I don't think I'll go to any, but I'll be keenly following all the results. Yes, I, it's not a high chance of me going, but uh, if I do, I, I just, I don't know, pre season, uh, when, I'm, when I'm working away, when I've been working away, uh, so different parts of the country. Pre-season has been an absolute godsend because it's something to do. You can probably find a game Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah. But when I'm sat at home, uh, the idea of just going down to a park and watching a... Mm, I, I mean, I like football, but football's always... It's more about the... Like, like your brother, Ryan, it's about the social aspect. Mm. Oh, it must you, be a Reddit thing, really. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. You know, I used to take advantage and go and maybe go and see a few places that I haven't seen before sort of and check out a couple of teams that are a bit further afield that I perhaps I wouldn't normally get to see but uh yeah not exactly going to do, be doing that this year so no. so there we go anyway uh does anyone have anything else we need to discuss before we uh, wrap things up I, no, no, no. I think I'm, I'm good really yeah I'm I think good. I'm good as well I think I'm good All right. well um, uh Tom do you want to let people know where they can find for the uh, football in Berkshire stuff? Yes, please send abuse um, and anything else to uh, at FI Berkshire on Twitter. You can find Football in Berkshire on Facebook and um, www.footballinberkshire.co.uk. Please come along and say hello and look at the website because uh, it's marvellous. Brilliant. And Ryan, everything from uh, Seven Sports, where can we get you? Sevensport.co.uk is the website. Info at sevensport.co.uk on the email. Facebook.com forward slash sevensport and at sevensport on Twitter. And also, uh, just a reminder to come back next week because Tom's going to have a list of 25 centre backs um, <laughs> that we can just work our way through. Exactly, yeah. A big epic next week that we're going to have to run about seven Twitter polls for. So, uh, <laughs> semi finals, finals. Well, all the we'll, way have, the, uh... we'll have left footed centre backs, right footed centre backs, six foot centre backs. Five foot yeah, centre backs. Yeah. We could best have centre back in the air. Best centre yeah. back. Yeah, could have central Berkshire centre backs, east Berkshire <laughs> centre backs. Uh, where can we have a west Berkshire centre back? No, not maybe. We'll see. Anyway, yeah, I'm done. One to look forward to. Anyway, <laughs> so um, before we uh, delve any further into that and to ruin all our content for next week, I will. Uh, we will wrap things up and say um, all that's left to say is goodbye from us. Uh, uh, Tom, do you want to say goodbye? Bye. Ryan, you want to say goodbye? Take care, everybody. And it's goodbye from me as well. Goodbye, right. Ryan. Goodbye. Ryan, don't fall over again. <laughs>